Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today I've got yet another great episode for you as we continue our journey through the cosmic rabbit holes into the unknown, trying to find and put all the pieces of the puzzle together and make sense of what escapes logical explanation. Or so we thought. One of the most intriguing and the least known esoteric practices cloaked in a veil of mystery, is shamanism. We know it was a common spiritual practice in old indigenous cultures in the Americas and Africa, and the first image that comes to mind when we think shaman is a dark-skinned man with eagle feathers sticking out from his long hair, a leopard skin wrapped around his body, dancing around a bonfire singing and rattling his rattle with the monkey bones. Maybe not. (laughs) But most people are not aware that shamanic practice is still well and truly alive today in Western cultures, perhaps without the leopard skin and the monkey rattle. (laughs) Now, my key question is, isn't the shamanism, witchcraft, psychic and spiritual work and quantum energy healing one and the same practice at the core? To explore this and many other fascinating questions about modern shamanism, I have invited someone who is a shamanic practitioner and has been for many years. My special guest today is Jan Engel Smith. Jan is an author, shamanic practitioner, Reiki master, licensed professional counselor, chemical dependency specialist and a hypnotherapist. Jan is considered an expert in her field. Her mission is to provide excellence in shamanic education and support personal growth and well-being, adapting ancient healing techniques to contemporary life in the 21st century. Jan has performed over 3,500 soul retrievals, a shamanic healing method which we will talk about. In 1994, Jan founded the Light Song School of 21st Century Shamanism and Energy Medicine and has developed the first energy medicine curriculum of its kind, all the way to doctorate in shamanism. Jan has written two books, Through the Rabbit Hole, Exploring Energy and the Shamanic Journey, and Becoming Yourself, The Journey from Head to Heart. And now, Jan joins me from Portland, Oregon. Hello, Jan. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Oh, and it's such a pleasure to be with you, Anna. Thank you so much for this invitation. (laughs) Lovely. You know, when I was interviewing a witch on my show last year, the first question I asked was, do you own a broom? (laughs) And she (laughs) said, And she said, yes, in fact, more than one. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I need to ask you, do you have a leopard skin and a monkey rattle in your shamanic possessions? (laughs) (laughs) I have many shamanic 
regalia items. Um, but the word shaman actually is a Siberian word. It doesn't really have anything to do with those native um, kind of imageries that you just. Uh, oh, how interesting. Uh, yeah. How, how uh, the, interesting. Word, uh, the word shaman means someone who sees in the dark with their heart. And that's actually mm. the definition. And again, it's Siberia. Beautiful. And Beautiful. every culture, even where you are in Australia with the Aborigines people, uh, everyone have studied uh, some form of this, these healing arts. Um, mm. there's, a, there's a common thread with them called core shamanism that uh, means like if you went to the seven continents of the world, and looked at their indigenous people and how they contacted spirit and how they performed their healings uh, on their, uh, what we would call clients or their people that came to them. There's a handful of things that are similar and those would be the core shamanic principles. And that's what uh, I study as well as teach and that way you're not involved with dogmas or you're not involved with any type of tradition. People can have whatever is in their natural lineage of their heart, their inner akasha that they mm -hmm. are called to and they aspire to or they feel and they're inquisitive about whatever that is. And we can flesh that out and help them find that inner shaman on the inside. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there is a lot uh, we have to talk about, but before we get to the nitty gritty of our conversation, could you please share with us your personal story leading you to this path? Yes. And this is a story that it's actually been published in a couple books and, you know, it's a story that's out there um, mm -hmm. because it is, it is one of a fascinating story. I, uh, was living in Dallas, Texas at the time in the United States, <clears throat> which is considered a Bible Belt area. And I was very much involved with the Christian church. And I had always been involved in the Christian church since I was a child. I had such a love for whatever that was, that that mystery, that, that um, greater being, and it's changed names and, and um, imageries for me now, but I just had such a, a love for it as a child. And I was very involved in the church. Um, I have a undergrad in biology and chemistry and then graduate work. My upper graduate works are all in psychology. So I was working at the time in a disassociative ward in a mental hospital with mm -hmm. people that had multiple personality. Mm -hmm. And I was walking through my living room. I also had three little kids. I had infant twins and a two-year-old. <laughs> so I had my hands full. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was walking through my living room and standing in my living room when I walked in there was a native woman, an old native woman. She had her hair pulled back. It was long gray hair that was pulled back in a bun. She had like a shawl around her. And I stopped, you know, and I was like, what, who, who are you? What are you doing in my house? <laughs> and her answer was, um, I am your grandmother. I am your mother. I am your sister. I am the earth. I am you, which was not <laughs> the answer I was expecting. Yeah. And um, she said, I'm here to ask you to learn the ways, but I will tell you if you decide to do this, that your life will forever be changed. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, no, you know, no, you need to leave. This is really weird. You need to get out of my house. But there was a crow that was cawing outside the window Instead of hearing ka ka ka, I was hearing trust, trust, trust. So mm -hmm. I did. I was like, okay, yes, I will learn the ways. She pulled out a pipe, which I have later learned the significance of this. 
and we smoked the pipe. And then she gave me what she called my medicine, which was the medicine of the North, which was or is love, wisdom, and healing. We were interacting very regularly, like you and I might be in a room. She was physical. But then I heard something. I thought my husband actually had come into the house or into the room. And I turned to look to see who had come in. And when I turned back, she was gone. Mm. So this just about dropped me to my knees. Um, my wow. family, my friends had all thought that I had just gone off the deep end. Because mm. again, I'm working in a psych ward. I'm working with uh, very, very, very disturbed people. I have my hands full with little ones and they just said, you know, you're working too hard. You need to get out of there kind of thing. And nobody was believing me. Mm. And I started to go through what is now what I understand now. I didn't know a thing about the ways. I had no idea what she was talking about. Again, I was raised in a very uh, Christian home. <clears throat> I, and I didn't know anything about a pipe, nothing. And um, now it's, I've learned what this word is. It's called dismemberment, where your life just starts to fall apart. And in shamanism, we dismember, or we go through the process of dismemberment to remember. It's like you're trying to, shed all of the things that are in the way that prevent you from a truth that you carry inside. For myself, how I experienced that though, mm. was a loss of friends. I was being asked to leave Sunday school that I just wasn't really fitting in the group anymore. And, uh, you know, it felt like I was being deserted uh, my husband was very supportive of me, but he was about the only one. And he even was, Jan, you know, you've really, <laughs> you've really s stepped off the, uh, <laughs> off the cliff here. However, um, I couldn't deny it. People will say, well, why don't you just say, eh, never mind, I must have been a bad dream. But I couldn't, I just couldn't deny it, even though I couldn't explain it. Somewhere in there, I had a dream uh, and in the dream, I was told to move to the Northwest, that the vortexes in the United States were changing from the Southwest to the Northwest and that I needed to go there. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know what a vortex was as far as I knew, knew it in physics, yeah. but I didn't know what it meant in metaphysics. And my husband, um, you know, he, he was just like, you're asking me to do what? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I have this dream. <laughs> but luckily, my best friend, my childhood best friend had just moved up to Portland, Oregon. And, and I said, well, let's just go up and visit and check it out. We did. And he was able to land the job of his dreams. And that was in March. And, and we were here by June. Yeah. And so it was just, not, that's not all, and it, it took longer than that, but those months uh, I remember very vividly. Mm -hmm. Then after we were here, he was at a conference and uh, he said, why don't you come down and look at some books that are down here? There's a, there's a display. You might be interested in these. And they were books on in reincarnation and channeling and all kinds of metaphysical ideas that I had never heard of really before. I had heard of re reincarnation, but I always thought it was just kind of a Buddhist concept and <laughs> hadn't given it much thought. Mm. So I went up to the clerk and I said, do you know anything about apparitions or visions? And she said, I don't personally, but I know somebody that does. And she handed me this woman's name on a card and I called her went in for an appointment and she channeled angels. And so I had this angel reading, which was very mysterious to me. And the angel said, this is your life. And she went over to a bookshelf and pulled out a book on soul retrieval. 
and handed me the book and she said, this is your life. And that's how it started. And so um, from that point, I read the book and I felt like I could have written it. I didn't know how I knew it, but as I was reading it, I just, it was so familiar. That same month I was invited to a sweat lodge and just all these different things. And the people at the lodge then brought me into a a Lakota Sioux family and the native family. And I started learning the native traditions and it just, it just all took off right at that point. And my life changed on a dime. It was completely different. Um, And that was 30 years ago. So (laughs) 30 years. (laughs) And here you are. (laughs) And here I am. Mm. Here I am. It's still, um, interestingly enough, this woman that did the channeling, I just reunited with her uh, on a lunch date about a month ago. (laughs) It was so nice to see her again. Okay, that that's interesting. Oh, lovely! Thank you for sharing. So, what is shamanism? And I'll ask my second question here as well. Aren't shamanism, witchcraft, psychic practice, quantum energy work, all one and the same at the core? Working essentially with energy at the intersection of science and spirituality. Yes, absolutely. I would say that the definition of someone who sees in the dark with a heart is the umbrella. And the umbrella then holds with it all of these different fields of alternative medicines, as well as quantum mechanics, of course. Quantum mechanics, to me, is just a modern way of describing shamanism that's exactly what we do and it Mm. it is such a great vehicle to be able to explain the multiple dimensions that we travel in and journeys and many of the uh, ways that we can do healings is very easily described in quantum mechanics so yes uh, i think that the thing that you have to be careful with is a little bit what you described earlier, Anna, in your description of what images things conjure up for people. And when you say witch, or when mm-hmm. you say shaman with monkey bones and wrapped in cloth, you know, it can it can be startling and scary to people because they think of it as a negative thing. And I've worked very hard in my life yeah. to uh start abolishing those types of images because it really has nothing to do with that. Um, Those are some aspects of it that you could look at in some cultures. But like I said, this is a cross cultural through all the cultures of the world. And uh, some of them would not look like that at all, but all of them are working with energy. And in my version of shamanism, And when I say my version, I think shamanism can take two different avenues. You have the Carlos Castaneda version, which is all about power and power over things. And then you have the the version that is the healer and is working with spirits that are benevolent and working through the shaman to create healing for others and so what's the difference between the two could you elaborate on that it's interesting well i think when you're looking for power it's an egoic thing and when you're looking for healing you transcend the ego and you step aside Mm -hmm. so you're talking about power over others not empowerment that's right Oh, okay so that's i i think old shamanism and that was one of the things that we had Uh, talked about in your questions to me is, you know, the difference between old shamanism and and what I call the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And 
old shamanism uh, was really based in, um, in taking power over something like over uh, a, an evil spirit or a illness that presents itself as bad or wrong or something like that. In 21st okay. century, there's no, there's no warring. There's no trying to gain power over something. We're doing healings on everything. So it doesn't matter how low a frequency is, is if it's turning out to be negative, or even if it was turning out to be um, what we would call evil or dangerous or lethal, it still can receive a healing and make things into a win-win situation instead of one, one wow. being winning and something else losing. That's a very interesting and quite significant difference. So thank you for explaining this particular difference and those two, if you like, schools, the old school and the new school of shamanism. So what are the key principles of shamanism? Let's focus on the modern one, as I call it, modern <laughs> shamanism. Sure. And I'm really one of the few people that practices the modern. Um, my Even my <laughs> colleagues that I was trained under... <laughs> <laughs> Still, I mean, we go head to head sometimes because it's like, oh, okay. I don't practice that way anymore. That's that's not the way I've been guided to practice. And I see that what Light Song, the, the school that I have and, and the name of the center, it, it's really working with ascension energies that are higher frequency energies that are coming to the planet and are here on the planet. And they are a new model outside of the old and again that's a quantum yeah. idea of these different realities and these different um, dimensions of so are you saying that even today there are shamans who practice the old tradition oh yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah, there are there are a lot of them a lot of them. right how can you tell the difference if you meet a shaman or can you <laughs> uh sure just listen to them talk. Okay. <laughs> listen to them talk and listen to how they're going to handle a situation. Right. And if it sounds like there's going to be warring against something, like they're going to try to overcome something or, yeah, mostly overcome something, who are they working with in the spirit realm? There's all different kinds of spirits that you can work with. And we only work with the benevolent realm uh, we don't work with anything that um is going to cause harm or lie or trick or do th do anything like that that's like a human mm. um human expressions in the spirit realm which they do exist but we don't work with them so you don't point the bone or cast spells or curses or <laughs> none of this negative <laughs> wine the curses we heal from the curses <laughs> yes uh, yes okay. and we do all those things again so that it's um bringing quality of life to people mm -hmm. the, the difference between what you just described cursing somebody or putting spells or something on somebody is integrity it's just intention and integrity and for me i know enough about energy that I wouldn't put myself in harm's way for the, if you want to use the term karmic whiplash or backlash mm. that you can get into uh, trouble with and not even know it, you know? And so we walk a very, very, very straight line of integrity uh, in our practices. Mm. Mm -hmm. and you don't cause harm, even if it's a malevolent thing that malevolent thing has a heart light in it. It has an existence, which we believe in to be made of love. And it's just gotten off path, so to speak. And so we bring it back uh, on path. So what is soul retrieval? Could you explain this for us, please? Sure. Soul retrieval, uh, again, is the field that I... Um, capitalized on and i you know i really feel it's the mo one of the most important healing uh, modalities 
that there is on the planet. And National Geographic dated it back about a hundred thousand years. And so that, you know, that goes way back. I don't even think of humans being around in the way that we know it as a hundred thousand years ago. But if you looked at yourself as like a, a jigsaw puzzle, and when you're born, you're born with all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And then you go through an experience, even birth can cause this, but you go through an experience that can be difficult or traumatizing to a certain extent. Um, you will lose one of those pieces. In psychology, we call this disassociation. You disassociate in order to tolerate or to withstand a situation that you're in. But psychology doesn't say, well, where does that piece go and how do you get it back? And so as you go through life, you're going to lose another piece and you're going to lose another piece and you're going to lose another piece and you're mm -hmm. going to lose another piece. And so your jigsaw puzzle now has got a lot of holes in it. In soul retrieval, what we're doing as a shaman, we're going to find those pieces of your energy, of your signature. Your signature has got a very specific read to it. It's you in all of your lifetimes for all of eternity. It's you. Okay. And that is your signature. And we find those pieces and literally bring them back into this dimension and blow them back into you. When they blow them back into you, all of a sudden, whatever it was that was bothering you or the symptoms that you have, have the opportunity to heal and many times miraculously heal right then. If it's a physical illness, it might take a little bit of time because the physical body is denser, but that, that energy that needed to be in place for you to, to be well is now back. The, the belief is, is that your soul or your energy system needs to be maintenanced. It needs to be taken care of. Just like you take a shower or you brush your teeth or you talk to a counselor every once in a while, all these for emotional or physical needs, you need to take care of yourself energetically. It's the most important part of you. Mm -hmm. And it's the part that if you keep that healthy, everything else will fall into place. Yeah. You you will age differently. You will you will be healthier, you will have greater happiness because you are complete in your energy system. Okay. And this can happen even after death because you can take care of your energy system even in the afterlife because it's still part of you and it goes through all lifetimes with you. Um, so that is a portion of soul retrieval. That That's what we're doing is we're maintenance scene, we're bringing back the parts of you that left, and then they need to be retrieved. Mm. Now, if it happened recently, like if you had a car accident, or you had a surgery, or you had an argument with somebody that was very difficult for you, your soul pieces are probably right next to you. You've heard the sign, I'm just beside myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you are you're out of your body <laughs> you're beside yourself okay yeah. and so it's very simple you can just reach out and grab them and bring them back in yourself but if it's been years that energy sort of floats away it floats off and it usually requires uh more of a professional to get in there and and find what they're doing, or especially if they need to go into another lifetime, if you had lost energy in another lifetime, that all of a sudden you're being plagued in this lifetime. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was one of my favorite case studies. This woman uh, came to me, she was just feeling very run down. Uh, she had great sadness in her she was in a loveless marriage, a lot of despair. She had been suffering with um, fibroids and could never get pregnant. She married early. She met this guy like a freshman or sophomore in, in high school and then married right out of high school. 
And she found that she just couldn't seem to make decisions for herself. She said, I would struggle with what kind of eggs to cook in the morning. It was just like everything was hard and difficult. Mm -hmm. So when I went into the journey asking the spirits to help me find what was going on, I said, take me to the root of this. Where, where did this actually start for her? And the next thing I knew, I was in this other lifetime. And I was in a lifetime where she was royalty of some kings and queens someplace, the daughter of the king and queen. And so she was married through um, an arranged marriage of uh, bringing countries together, you know, and it was a, you know, like you're going to marry them and then we're going to be forever bonded to this other group of people. And because of this marriage, there will be safety in the kingdom. So okay. she didn't really have choices mm -hmm. herself. Mm -hmm. It was also done very ceremonially, huge ceremonies, candles and rites of passage or, or rites being said and contracts being written. And then there was this pressure to have a male heir. And if you didn't have a male heir, you might not survive. They might <laughs> do away with you for some reason. So these, these tremendous pressures were on her in this other lifetime. So we come into this lifetime and you can see she meets the same guy that she was married to. She doesn't know why she's mm -hmm. going to marry him, but she knows she is. She's young. It's a loveless thing, but she feels compelled to marry him. And then has, you know, issues with her childbearing. She develops fibroids. She ends up adopting kids. Da, 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 da. And so what we do is we go into this other lifetime and not only bring her soul pieces back from that time, but also unwind that vow. She made a vow in this other lifetime that is still living today. And vows do. <laughs> you know, you need to learn how to energetically unwind things. Uh, yeah. Because just because you divorce somebody or you die doesn't mean that the energy of yeah. that ceases to exist. In quantum, we know that it lives forever. You know, the first law <laughs> of physics is energy put in motion stays in motion until it's interrupted by something else. And so what we're doing in shamanism is we're interrupting that and we're unwinding it. We're clearing it. We're giving things new endings. Da, 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 da. And so it, it was a fascinating study because I think most of us can have really great visuals because we've seen these things on television. You know, we've seen how this works and you're going, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can see the effects of it in this lifetime where those things were not taken care of and healed or changed. And so- So what happened with her? Well, she divorced her husband <laughs> immediately and he wanted it <laughs> out of it too. You know, they were both just bound in this-, in this yeah. um, uh, contractual energy that neither one mm -hmm. of them understood. She divorced him and um, just really got her life back. You know, she's, I, I've kept up with her and she's, she's just radiant and living life mm -hmm. fully and happily. So. Beautiful, beautiful story. So can anyone learn to be a shaman? Is there any special initiation required? Or do you need to be born with certain predispositions such as active psychic senses, etc.? Or can anyone do it? Anyone can do it. Anyone can see in the dark with their heart. Okay. Um, it is absolutely uh your psychic abilities you're born with and 
all most of us turn them off or down by the time we're about four or five. And so a lot of things is just a matter of re-remembering. There are, of course, initiations that go through, but it's not like your mine was an exceptional case. You know, I would say that I was born into this and I was I'm doing something that I've probably done. In fact, one psychic told me 386,000 times, you know, I've been doing this. <laughs> so, you know, I guess I'm been doing it for a long time. But um, but no, I mean that's what our school does. We train people and most mm-hmm. people uh, don't know a thing about it, but they have wonderings. I call them longings. Like just something doesn't feel like right. I don't feel like I fit someplace. I know that there's more going on here than I've ever learned in school or what people talk about. I feel like I can, things are alive around me. I talk to clouds or I talk to trees or (laughs) whatever. (laughs) And yeah, so we bring them into the school. I don't expect you to know anything, and we teach you how to how to do it. Okay. And uh, okay. it's your birthright. It's your birthright, really, yeah, to be yeah. happy and to energetically be able to take care of yourself. Mm. Yes, and we will talk more about your programs and courses uh, a bit later on. Now, Jan, um, I've got a an important question, which is bugging me a bit. <laughs> in fact, this is about not just shaman specifically, but also it relates to any psychic work with clients or with another person. So now coming back to specifically to the shaman's work, can a shaman access someone's Akashic records for the purpose of soul retrieval or any other spiritual healing? And the reason I'm asking is that there are many psychic practitioners who claim that they can access people's Akashic records so they can see their soul history or their lifetimes, etc. Now, if that's true, and by the way, I accept that this is possible as a concept, so I have no, no problem with that. But the issue that I have is that my Akashic records, for example, are for my eyes only. And so no one else should be able to access it, to access this information, just like, and I I usually compare it to my bank account, okay? No one can just simply go to my bank and say, oh, I want to check and access Anna's account and see what's there. Well, no, you can't. (laughs) This is only for the account's owner. So could you please talk to, firstly, whether this is the case that, accessing the person's Akashic records is part of the shamanic healing process. And secondly, what are the ethical guidelines, if you like, because, you know, it's like, you know, as I said, walking into someone's house or accessing someone's personal details. And even if the client gives permission for this to happen, the very fact that a shaman or a psychic can get access to this information, it doesn't quite sit with me very well. So could you please speak to this? Absolutely. And I will qualify. To me, the difference between a psychic and a shaman is that the psychic gets information and can be informative. The shaman gets information, and then does healing work. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you, I think a lot of people can't wrap your head around, myself included, because it's a, it's a vast concept. And that is, is your immortality that you have been around forever. So your Akashic records are vast. There is nothing you have ever not been or whatever will be. I mean, you, the, in shamanism, in the core, the idea is that you are the universe. You are it. Yeah. You are the entire thing. Mm. The universe is all within you. So we call it the inner Akasha. Now, this is very hard to, again, fathom. 
with your left brain. Uh, shamanism is a really very strong right brain uh, experience. Without going down that rabbit hole, <laughs> um, if you're coming to me as a client, yes, you are giving me permission. And yes, we are working on very specific things in the vastness of the universe to help you be better. And yes, of course, I can see into the Akasha, but it's so vast, I have to have a path. You know, it's, it's like, um, if, if I don't have a path, if I don't have a clear intention, then who knows where I'm going to end up. And it's, it would just end up to be gibberish. It would, it would it wouldn't make any sense and it wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> it's pointless. But if the intention yeah. is, is for you to have wellness, that you've been plagued with something, let's say something that happened to you when you were a child that you can't seem to get over with. Like, why? Why? And that, that was the thing that drove me out of psychology, or not really out of psychology, but I, I was like, why is it taking so long to pe for people to heal over something that happened when they're five? They're spending their whole life trying to heal from this. What's going on? What is wrong here? And I realized, well, because the parts that left them when they were five need to be retrieved and brought back, and then they'll have wholeness and be able to move on from the experience. So to get back to your thing, the path is, what is your problems? Like, what are the issues that are presenting to you that brings you to me in the first place? And how do we heal them? And so it would be just like in your analogy of your bank account, if you were working with a financial advisor, he'd have to see your bank accounts. <laughs> you know, you have to see him see what's going on and to move money True. around and to <laughs> invest for you wisely. Um, and that is, yeah. again, another reason why I am so driven by ethics and by integrity, uh, because these are people's lives and you never do anything that would be harming or saying something just because it sounds really great to you that possibly could be wounding to that person. Um, and so we call them the healing stories. What are the healing stories that I'm gonna tell you about to help you in your process of healing? And you were right. Mm -hmm. You have you get to call the shots. If you say no, I don't want you to look there. Internally, psychically, you can put up walls to me that I can't get into your system. And I, I have that happen all mm -hmm. the time. I'll say, okay, you want me to come in, but you're not letting me in. <laughs> Tell me about the wall here that you put up, and mm -hmm. what are you really <laughs> afraid of? And that's usually part of what needs to be healed. Uh, There's a fear there of being exposed or vulnerable or hurt. It's all part of the story. Yeah. And that's respectable. And, um, yeah. and we learn, you know, I don't go mm. through um, my life reading people. That's overwhelming. I do it when I'm working. If not, I don't have those parts of me engaged. Um, like they're not engaged right now with mm. you. I could, but I'm not going to. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we, we teach those <laughs> types of strong ethics. But truly, you are sovereign to yourself. And you have the power to keep people out energetically. Um, if somebody, if I'm talking to somebody and I can feel them pulling on me, like they're going, ooh, I want what you have. This is, I want, I want some of your energy. I want this. I want that. In my mind, I might be saying, stop. No, you, you don't have access to me like that. And so you're mm -hmm. just, you have that ability. We all do. Um, yeah. Children are a little bit more psychically vulnerable. And that's usually mm -hmm. why they get wounded when they're little. And we're working on it when they're adults. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> because <laughs> they, they were vulnerable. Uh, to their parents usually or to yeah. their caregivers or their coaches or their teachers or something like that.
Beautiful. Thank you for explaining this. So let's now talk about shamanic regalia and ceremonies. Could you give us a bit of a sneak preview into the world of the shamanic practice in terms of the uniqueness of it? Sure. Again, that would be determined by how you're learning and who you're learning from. But regalia is often a very important part of people's practices. Things that you're wearing have been what we would call energetically imbued with possibly energies from your spirit helpers or different ceremonies that you've gone through, um, different rituals that you might do to imbue something. And when you put that item on, it energetically changes you. That This is an energetic imprint that you're putting on and it changes you energetically. And when I'm talking about changing myself energetically, what I'm usually doing is I am raising my vibration much higher. The, the spirits have much higher vibrations than we do in our human form. And so I'm raising my vibration. I'm moving from my left brain, which has got my ego in it, into my right brain that is ego-free. And I am working as a conduit for the spirits. They are working through me. And the regalia can help you with that. It can help change your energy. Uh, and it could be a scarf. It could be a whole outfit. In one of the classes that we teach, now this is an advanced class that you're, you would do. You are contacted by a particular being, energy being, that wants to be, um, have, it wants to have a message that comes through. And you spend a year actually getting these messages and the regalia to wear. And so it's, it's quite beautiful. At the end of the year, we present these and people are decked out in their beautiful, beautiful, beautiful regalias. And they bring through these messages, usually to the planet that these spirits are trying to bring through. We can ask them questions and we can also receive healings from them. So the regalia is a beautiful representation. Um, it's not a costume. It's not something that you would wear to a party. You know, it's something that's mm -hmm. sacred and you yeah. uh, it kind of, you know, it, it's, it's all through our, you know, the priests wear their regalia, the nuns wear their regalia, you know, like it's through religions that you see it too, but mm -hmm. Put it on yeah. and it brings forth a particular energy imprint. What's the deal with the rattle? Why is the rattle important? The rattle and the drum both are ancient. They're the first things that people had as sonic instruments to change your brain waves. And when you think about it, mm -hmm. the drum beat is the first beat that you hear as a fetus, the heartbeat of the mother. So when you're hearing a drum beat, it takes you again into this altered state. We've, we've trained ourselves in our cultures um, to be in the left brain, which is all about sequential ordering and logic and figuring things out, cause and effect. This happens, so that means that happens, da 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 da, da. It's all this, all of our schooling, our politics, our religious things are all based in this left brain logical sequential ordering where you're actually born all children are born more right brained and this is where you you are fascinated you can see things in the other realms the spirits live there the clairs live there the clairvoyant clairaudient clairsentient claircognitive all of those clairs are in the right brain which means you're seeing things that 
your left brain can't see. You know, you're seeing spirits or you're, you're hearing voices that your regular ears can't hear. So you're, you are needing instruments sometimes to move you into the right brain experience because one, once we're conditioned to school or once we, our parents start teaching us how to put the square block in the square hole, they are conditioning us to be in that left brain all the time, all right? And so it now takes effort to learn mm-hmm. how to be in the right brain, which meditation does that. Being mindful and present does that. And of course, journeying in a shamanic uh, reality does that. And that to me does it best <laughs> because it's, it's, I've looked at the studies. I've looked at the studies of people being hooked up to EEGs and stuff where they're doing brain waves. and you put drums and rattles on and poof, you go off the charts into the, into the right brain. And so the rattle again is a very ancient thing that creates a sonic sound and that sonic sound then moves you into the right brain. Now in your part of the world, the didgeridoo Mm -hmm. is used a lot and they're great, but cross-culturally around the world, the two things were the drum and the rattle. And we still give babies rattles. You know, why do we do that? You know, (laughs) you know, because it's been around since the beginning of time. (laughs) Very good point. Yes, I didn't think about it. Very good point. Babies rattle to calm them down and, and put them to sleep. And yes, very good, very good point. Beautiful. So what are animal totems or power animals? And how can we identify what is our power animal? What is their role? How useful this information can be to us? Well, it's extremely useful. I was, again, adopted into a Lakota family uh, about 28 years ago. And one of the elders told me one time that they believe that you are born with 405 helping spirits (laughs) at birth. (laughs) Now, that's not a literal number, but it's a number of quantity, a huge amount. Your power animals are part of that 405, meaning that you're not born alone. You are first and foremost a spirit having a human experience. And most of your spirit is not in this realm. It's in, a, it's in the quantum fields, okay? If you think of an inverted triangle on your head, going up from your head, just a little point going into the top of your, into your pineal gland, is part of your energy system that is animating your body. You know, it's giving you life, it's giving you motion, it's giving you life here on this planet. But a majority of you is not there. It's in these other realms. This is where all the other spirits are too. So the more you get to know your allies, know your helpers, the more access they have to you that then can help you make decisions live your life well, give guidance, all these different things. I mean, you do not have to do this life by yourself. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. You know, and when you don't have it all figured out, mm. you have very little information here to go with. So ask, mm. ask for help. And these are your helpers, your power animals. Now, totems to me, and this, totems are personality um, traits. Like you have the work ethic of a beaver, you know, like your, or the, uh, the detailness of a mouse or the vision of an eagle. Those are personality type of things. Okay. For me, that would be what you would look up in a book. You know, I don't know if you have this in your country, but Ted Andrews, Animal Speaks and 
Jamie Sands medicine cards. Those are very popular here in the States. And people will run to those and think, oh, that's my power animal. It's like, no, it's not. Those are totems. Mm -hmm. Those are an author's description of something. Your power animal are these beings that are in the animal kingdom that were sort of assigned to you at birth. And they're very task oriented. They help you with things and you learn about them in your shamanic study. So the first class that you would take, you're going to learn your power, one of your power animals and your spiritual teacher in different worlds. You, you might learn maybe a dozen of them throughout your career, or maybe a little bit more. You don't have to know all 405, but you have access to all of these beings and they're there to help you to make, again, decisions from, you know, should I move across the country to help me find a parking place? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you ask them. But if you ask them, you're not just dependent on your own resources anymore. You've got the universe at your fingertips to help you with whatever it is that you're working on. Mm. But speaking of power animals in particular, are you saying that we have more than one? Yes. And and if so, or perhaps one like the main one and then others, yes. uh, other than taking a course in shamanism, is it possible for us to identify what is my key power animal in some ways? Yeah, you, you don't have to take a course. You can um, definitely do this through silence or just putting some drums on for yourself if you wanted to and asking who they are. They will identify themselves for you. Okay. Um, lots of times uh, when I bring back a power animal for somebody, they'll say, oh my God, that was my favorite animal as a child. Or I lived on Wildcat Drive as a kid. You know, there's always some sort of little connection that they yeah. have been trying to, the, the, the animal has been trying to get your attention for a long time. We have fondness for them. Like, oh, I've just loved horses all of my life. Well, probably because it's your power animal, you know, what, or I love elephants or whatever. Um, and they're the nation of that. And power animals are very task oriented. Like when I was writing my first book, I thought, oh my gosh, I, I didn't ever have any dreams of writing a book. The spirits wanted me to write it. And I said, no, you got the wrong person. You know, I, I can't even spell, <laughs> you know, <laughs> This is not my forte. <laughs> They're like, no, you're going to write this book. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm going to get a power animal to help me write the book. So I did a journey and asked who was going to come in. And it was the raccoon. I said, raccoon, why yeah. you? you know, what, what are you bringing me? And they said, <laughs> dexterity of the fingers. <laughs> it's like, because this was back in, I think I wrote my first book in 98. So, you know, computers were just kind of a new thing and oh right yeah. okay you know and <laughs> and you're not going to read that in animal speaks or medicine cards it, it was a mm. personal thing that they were coming in to help me with they're yeah. very very task oriented are they also protective animals like do do they protect us specifically in spirit yes some are your protectors some are task oriented some are in shamanism, we believe that you're born with a particular power animal mm -hmm. and that if that power animal were to leave you in your life, it would be like soul loss. You would actually have a adverse response to that in that you would have a lack of power. When I, I wanted to know my birth power animals so bad. You know, I'd been in shamanism for quite a while and uh, I had several power animals, but I knew that none of them were my birth power animal. And I, I could never get them to answer me. Like, what's my birth power animal? What's my birth power animal? They wouldn't answer me. They wouldn't answer me. 
this, and then I was going through a ceremony. I was learning how to become a water pourer for sweat lodges. And I was going through this very involved ceremony where we had to make a medicine bowl with our hands out of clay and um, shape it and then fire it in a bonfire type of thing instead of a kiln. And you had to take your hair, uh, uh, you know, some hair strands and throw it into the fire onto the bowl. And when it hit the bowl, it burnt in and there was a divination then in the bowl that talked about your life path. Okay, so the bottom of the bowl represented your birth. And then as you went up the sides, it shows it shows your life. And this is all burnt in again from this hair that hits and all of a sudden makes all these shapes and stuff on the, on the bowl. So there at the very bottom on my birth was a perfect bear. Just, uh, I mean, it was absolutely no questions that that's what it was. Uh, now, I had never worked with a bear in all of my work. It wasn't part of my soul retrieval work. It wasn't part of anything that I had done. But there it was, the bear. And so I was like, uh, that's my birth. And, um, um, and since then, I have honored it and I was initiated into a bear clan tribe and um and I use it as a I have I have a bear skin. I actually hit a bear with my car. <laughs> oh. <laughs> was, no, you're not supposed to hit your you know but it turned out to be a medicine bear. And so did it die? Yes it died and I took oh. I took it, packed it up in my trunk. <laughs> And it turned out to be a medicine bear that I was to use the skin uh, for healing. And so it gave itself to me. Mm. So it was, it was yeah. it's a beautiful story. But, you know, and people will hit small animals and total their car. And it, I had no damage to my car. <laughs> I hit a bear. Oh, you know, it, was, it was just, it was very miraculous in how that all happened. interesting i've been since my early childhood i've been very attracted to horses i just love horses and uh, at some point in my life i used to ride on a horse a bit but not for a very long time but i absolutely love horses so i'm thinking that it is possible that horse is my power animal i mean i love all animals but horses in particular yeah there's a special fondness there for them yeah and that's usually a strong indicator and again we have many yeah and if you walk you know you can flesh that out you don't have to ride them but you can meet with the the horse in the spirit realm and have a relationship with it there yeah they're they're beautiful they're beautiful beings yeah Yes. Jan, earlier on, we just mentioned briefly curses and spells. I would like to talk now about the power of words and the power of the intention behind words, because I think this is an important subject and knowledge to bring up to people's attention, because we use in everyday life words quite often without thinking and without necessarily going into you know the um the magical or psychic side of life even when we say something that is negative it can actually hurt the person so could you please speak to the power of words and the intention of words and this obviously is regardless of what language we speak because it is the intention and energy behind words. So could you please speak to this for a moment? Yes. And you are exactly right, Anna. The more people understand that, the healthier 
they will be. This is a critical thing to understand. A friend of mine has friends that are live in um, Switzerland, and they speak several languages, and, and they'll never argue in English because it's too damaging. It's too damaging because of the words that we have. Wow. So, um, yes, you're exactly right. Also, that we're very sloppy with our words. We're, we're saying things and not paying attention to the impact. One of the things that is important to understand in the quantum world, as well as, of course, in shamanism, is that everything is energy. Everything is energy. Mm -hmm. You are energy. Words are energy. Thoughts are energy. Items are energy. Everything is energy. You, yourself, are a very high-frequency energy system. If you were to measure it, you can you, you can see where it falls, like on a scale. It's a very high frequency system. Words such as love, radiance, beauty, magnificence, stellar, stunning, compassion. You can feel those words. They come in and you know, for me, right then when I was saying that, my shoulders were going back, my chest was opening. The reason our body is responding to that is because they're a match for your energy. They're the, a match for your soul, okay? Meaning that they're good for you. They actually could create healing. If you were ill, you could be saying these types of words to yourself and create healing just like a shaman would do for you yeah okay, or the spirits would do for you i should say the, sh the shaman's really not doing anything it's the spirits working through the shaman that's doing it whereas if you're saying negative words or you're thinking negative things the body will often go concave and i'm not even going to say them because they're awful but you'll feel it your body will go concave your shoulders will come down you'll start protecting your heart in your body language because they're they're hurtful they're damaging and it's like the body is saying warning 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 this can hurt you so the belief in shamanism is is that you know there's no such thing as like a pollutant or a, a or a, a damaging thing it's the vibrational thing that is either an attraction or a not attraction they believe that Polluted water is just from negative thinking. Dr. Emoto, who is a Japanese doctor that worked with water, you might be familiar with him. Yeah. He did beautiful studies with this. And yeah. that, you know, you pray over water and the pollution goes away. <laughs> you know, you change, <laughs> you change the component of it. It, it, it clears up. And yeah. we are mostly water. We're 75% water. And so we're going to respond. That's why those studies of water were so important because our bodies do the same thing because we're mostly water. And so when you're saying negative things, when you're thinking negative things, when you're angry about the news or the government or whatever's going on, you are affecting your health. Okay. When somebody says mean things to you, they are affecting your health. Yeah. So the word curse is a pretty strong word, but it's the word that has been used in shamanism forever. It, an, another uh, way of describing that would be like a, a an overshadowing or something that is um, intrusive. It's like an yes. Intrusion. And interestingly, I just thought of something. Interestingly, the word curse it is is often used to describe vulgar vulgar language yes so when someone is is cursing a curse means to harm. they would often use bad language <laughs> which is hurt, hurtful in terms of energy so i just i think it's just a, an interesting parallel here versus the other one which is blessing yeah a blessing is to create 
fortune, goodness, well-being, and a curse is to create harm or misfortune mm. to someone. So again, it's just there. It's all energy. It's how you're how you're working with it and what you're doing with it. And we're so removed. We've been so poorly trained in how to take care of ourselves energetically that we use words like they don't have an effect on us. In fact, there's a slogan that I remember as a child, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And that's baloney. <laughs> yes, they can. Mm. You know, that People are damaged from words uh, for sometimes years because it had such an adverse effect on them. Absolutely. But the thing that I love about shamanism and I love about the, the quantum actually is that anything that's been done can be undone and anything that's been harmed energy changes with intention energy is not created or destroyed again it's a physical it's a physics understanding it's not created or destroyed it just changes form yeah so you can take whatever was damaging and turn it to the good mm -hmm. just through intention and through learning how to work with energy you don't have to recreate anything. It's it's you just change it energetically, and in that energetic change, then you can create wellness. And I'll give you an example of this at a very elementary level. Mm -hmm. Take a look at what you think about during the day. You know, just monitor yourself for an hour, and think about how much worry you have. You know, if you're concerned about this or concerned about that, and you're fretting about this, or you are having issue with a loved one or a friend or whatever, all that energy that goes into that. And so let's say that you do that for an hour. Now, the next hour, I want you to think about all the things that you appreciate. For a whole hour, all you can think about is all the things you appreciate. Energetically, you have just changed your your entire system and your health has just changed into this higher frequency. Most people worry instead of think about appreciation. <laughs> That's the way that their, their yeah. thinking patterns have developed. Yep. Um, it only takes 30 seconds to change your vibration. 30 seconds. So if you started your day every day, with positive words. You know, I have lists of positive words that I give to people. Just read these things. <laughs> Just reading them will change yeah. your vibration. Yeah. And the more you do that, the more you'll learn how to do it automatically. Or think good things about yourself. What do you love about yourself? What do you love about yourself? You know, well, I really love that I have a kind heart, or I really love that I love horses. I really love that I care about getting good content on the radio waves and on podcasts. I really love that if you just thought about that every day, you would become healthier because it's all energy. Yes, and even an easy way for us to notice it, notice the change, is that when we think positive thoughts and when we speak positive words, we can actually feel that they are uplifting. And we often use that expression, you know, this is very uplifting. So uplifting means I feel that I have raised in my energy above the level that I was before. Conversely, some people and words and situations and thoughts are depressing, lowering our energy. So what we want to do is to use uplifting to raise to a higher level. Very important. If you just spent five minutes a day, just five minutes a day, it would be remarkable what you could do. When I was going through the training myself, for me, you know, like, how does this work? What I did was I took a, a piece of paper, a small piece of paper, and I folded it up. And I stuck it under my ring and it didn't say anything on it. It was just an irritant that I felt. And whenever I felt it, which was pretty much all the time, I think, okay, what are you thinking about? What are you feeling right now? 
And if I was feeling anything lower than hopeful or optimistic, I would say, do something about it. Think different mm-hmm. things. And I just trained Good myself. strategy. Well, it's just habit. Yeah. It's habit. It's how you were raised. And it's the, the thought processes that you developed as a person. And all of that is changeable. Mm. First, you have to identify it and say, oh, look at what I'm doing and admit that you're doing it. <laughs> Once you do that, then it's, yeah. it's pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it does take, it takes some time. It takes a little bit of effort. But as in any new habit, you develop a new habit. Yeah. And the habit of positive thinking is a good habit to have. Yes, and it has an accumulative effect once it starts really being engraved in our psyche. Uh, we will pretty soon notice its positive effects, and then, interestingly, we would notice when other people use lower frequency language or thoughts or uh, conditioning because it is so different at that point in time to ours. So then we can help others and we can talk to them and, and suggest similar techniques, put a piece of paper underneath your ring and <laughs> uh, or, or just use whatever technique and just to pay attention, be very self-aware and self-observant. Beautiful. Well, Jan, would you like to tell us a um, bit more about your courses, your programs, and your books. And I will include all the links in the show notes so that people will be able to to contact you and reach out to you if they are interested in this topic. Just could you give us a brief overview of your offerings? Absolutely. And thank you, Anna, for that opportunity. I appreciate that. The name of the school is Light Song, Light Song School of 21st Century Shamanism and Energy Medicine. We have everything from a basic class of learning how to journey and discovering your first two allies, which is your power animal and your teacher, all the way up through doctoral level. We're the only school that offers actually uh, bachelor's, master's and doctoral programs. So these would be people that wanna do a career with it. Most people would be a casual interest. You know, I. I always say, if you learn these things, you'll be a better mother, you'll be a better spouse or partner, you'll be a better citizen of the world, you'll be a better neighbor, you'll take care of your home, you'll take care of your office space differently, because you know how to work with energy, and you know how to clear things, and you know how to bring things back, and you know how to change the energy imprint that we were just talking about, these these frequencies. So all of these things uh, are available to people that want to want to learn how to do this. We usually offer these basic classes virtually ever since the pandemic, we have gone fully virtual. Now, Mm -hmm. eventually, we will get back to maybe a hybrid course. So it opened it up to the world for us because it used to be that you had to move to Portland, Oregon in order to participate. But now we have a a global audience. Uh, I'm going to be teaching this class again in January of 2023, the 21st and 22nd of January, if people Mm -hmm. are interested. And it's usually taught a couple times a year. And then from there, you can go into the, you know, further work. Um, I have a lot of, I have two books that I've written, a lot of guided imagery. Um, I also have done podcasts for years. Um, I have over a hundred of them available to people. If you just want to listen to people will have questions and how would you answer this? Or what would you do from a shamanic perspective of how to deal with this issue? And that's 
very much what they've been about. There's a lot of free things. On the Facebook page, I have a thing called the Feel Good Challenge, which is exactly what we were just talking about. I write a little statement. People put their high frequency words on it. You read these, your vibration changes. It's my way of reaching you every day for five minutes that can change your vibration. Um, mm. And that's all free. Mm. Uh, we do talking sticks. Again, all of these things are available to the public. If you just want to be with like-minded folks and hearing how other people approach life. To me, shamanism approaches life through respect, through respect and caring about I always tell my grandkids, you care about the little things, you know, <laughs> you just, it's not just the big things you care about, but you care about the little things too. Yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you care about nature and, and you care about helping others. And um, so we have a lot of different possibilities there for people that uh, need things to be free. And then we have things that you can, contact the office at info at lightsong.net and get a list of practitioners. If something I've said, you said, I want a healing, then we have practitioners that will do that. All of our practitioners are high level cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. You don't get to be a practitioner because you took a weekend class. <laughs> you know, okay. You've studied for years. Good to hear. <laughs> yeah. It's like a shaman is a doctor of the soul. And we take this very seriously. Like you're a doctor, like you, you do that kind of training and you know what you're doing yeah. and you do it well. And we, we really pride ourselves in that. Um, and so, Lovely. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Well, Jan, thank you so much. But before we close, I would like to ask, is there any, final thought or a summary or anything that you would like to leave our audience with key message perhaps yes i think the most important thing that i try to relate to people is that you get to be happy you really do there's nothing that has actually happened to you that cannot be fixed on some level energetically that allows you to move into being the person that you ultimately desire to move into. Like some people feel so blocked or incapable. All of that can be unraveled and changed. So in life is short, enjoy it. And what you do in this lifetime will affect your other lifetimes. <laughs> you can't trick energy. You can't say one thing and feel another or think you can get away with something, you can't. It's it's energy and it it all does something. It's either a positive effect for you or a negative effect for you. And so decide how you want to live your life and what you want to gain, what how how that how you can really thrive and be well. And we can figure out how to do that for you. You know how to there's help. There's always help available to you. <laughs> Absolutely. And yes, all needs to be congruent. Energy needs to be congruent with thoughts, between thoughts and words and actions. That's very important. And thank you so much, Jen. And it's very, uh, very inspiring and gives hope to people to when they can understand that, as you have said so beautifully, uh, anything can be fixed at the energy level. And I absolutely and truly believe that this is the case. So um, very well said. And thank you so much for this lovely conversation. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you on Quantum Living. And thank you for being on my show. You are entirely welcome. And I put the blessing on you of great success with this Anna and that all of your dreams come true because I know you're reaching a vast audience and 
we need more people like you doing these things because it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All the best. Namaste. Namaste. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.